Good evening, good afternoon, whatever evening, whatever it is. Thank you for giving me some of your time uh, this afternoon. Uh, I don't have slides because this sort of subject doesn't lend itself to them. And it's like I've got some quotations from people like Casbitz, which I can't memorize. I'm going to be a little bit script bound until we uh, have QA. and I'll kind of rush through the talk and then we'll have leave as much time as we can for questions and answers. And the subject is the, the failing of military intervention. And this is brought about this topic, I think, largely by interest in the possibility of Western military intervention in Syria. Now, that looks like it's off the cards at the moment, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the specifics of the Syrian case. Rather, what I'm going to do is create a general argument against military intervention, and then at the end, talk a little bit about the specifics about Syria, but we could talk more about Syria in Q&A if you really want. But basically, this is a generic argument against military intervention. And we use the word nowadays, intervention, because we try and pretend it's not war. Intervention is war. Okay? So really what we're talking about is the ethics of war. Okay? And whether war is a good idea, because let's not pretend. Okay? If we're talking about intervening in Syria, we're talking about waging war. Okay? Now in the last 20 years, there's been a very considerable change in attitudes towards war. During the Cold War, when I was an army officer, when I were young, like you, um, we four of our armed forces did, as being to deter war, to stop the Soviets in invading, okay? not about waging war. That has now changed. Because we do not have any serious conventional opposition, we wish to use our overwhelming power. And so we find the legal and ethical constraints on us as a rather unwelcome constraint on our freedom. And in consequence, we've come, to, we've come up with all sorts of justifications why the rules of the international order should be abandoned to allow us to use force and, and the famous responsibility to protect as an example. Thus our politicians and our philosophers have presented new arguments in favour of concepts such as humanitarian intervention. And in doing so, I believe we have gone in entirely the wrong direction. And I'll give you a number of reasons why. First of all, I think we need to examine the nature of war. If you're going to discuss whether something is a good idea or not, you need to understand what it is. So, first of all, we have to discuss the nature of war and show that war is inherently unsuited to be a tool of policy and particularly of humanitarian objectives. And then secondly, I'll outline certain costs that war imposes on us and on our form of government. And then I'll just wrap up with a few words about Syria. Now, those who support military interventions in places like Syria have an excessively glossy memory of our past record. They'll say, look at Libya, I'll say, look, we overthrew Gaddafi, that worked. And then forget all the times it failed, like Afghanistan or Iraq. And say, well, next time we'll get it right. <coughs> and in this sense, we're like gamblers who win a session at the roulette table and therefore decide that roulette is a really good idea. But just because sometimes you can win at roulette does not mean that you should play roulette. Okay? If you want to end up on top, you should never play roulette at all because it's rigged against you. Okay. In the same way, war is rigged against you. Okay. It is something which if you keep on doing it, you will end up worse off. Guaranteed. Okay. Well, why is this? Well, first of all, it's a mathematical certainty that both sides can't win. Okay. So at maximum, 50% of people can come outside better off. Okay. Maximum, 50%. But actually, most of the time, neither of them do. So the number of times in which somebody ends up better off as a result of war is very, very small. So your odds of being better off are mathematically certainly small. Okay? This is guaranteed. So if nothing else, it makes sense for us to create rules of the international order which make it as difficult for us to do this as possible. Okay? That means not having rules such as R2P, which make it easier. Now, the drive to lower the barriers to war derives in part from the fact that in the post-Cold War era, we think that we can wage war relatively safely because we're so powerful, and even if it's badly wrong, you know, so what? 100 Canadians die in Afghanistan, no one really notices, okay? So what? I'd go down more. Okay? But this derives from a misunderstanding of the nature of war, which in turn derives from a combination of liberal naivety and enlightenment rationalism which together create the illusion that we can rationally apply and control force as a tool for making the world a better place. 
This is a fantasy because war is not a controllable phenomenon subject to scientific exact rules. Now, the great Prussian military theorist Karl von Clausewitz explained this well in his book on war. And he was responding to um, the sort of post Newtonian Enlightenment rationalism, which believed that you could reduce human society, but because the world was governed by rules of physics, you had understand the rules of human society in the same way, and then apply those rules to make the world better pleasant. But what, and this led in the 18th century to, to very strategists basically coming up with strategies which reduced war to mathematical formula, and said if you do x, y, what happens in the win. And Clausewitz said, well this just is nonsense, because war is not a science, it's an art. Okay? And it's not subject to immutable mathematical principles for a number of very good reasons. First of all, it's not a one-sided process. It's not something in which when you do X, Y happens. Because there's somebody else out there always trying to thwart you. So one time you do X, Y happens, the next time Z happens, the next time alpha happens, and so on. So you can't think because, oh, this worked last time, it's going to work next time. You never know what the result is going to be. As a result, war, Calvin has pointed out, is the realm of uncertainty, chaos, and chance. And Calvin said, no other human activity is so continuously or universally bound up with chance. Yet we continue to ignore this fact and treat force as a precise instrument we can use to get predictable policy outcomes in a predictable fashion. And this is extremely foolish because it runs contrary to the nature of what we're doing. Now, Canadian philosopher Brian Orrand at the University of Waterloo, for instance, has written a lot about uh, justice after war and the need to rebuild war shattered societies such as Iraq and Afghanistan. And he says there's a historically grounded recipe for making these places a better place. And we know this recipe produces better results. All you need is the will and the resources to push it through. But this makes the mistake of reducing complex human phenomena to a simple algorithm. That we know the formula, all we're going to do is apply it. We don't know the formula. Or if we do, we're really bad at applying it. So let's just compare my, return to my comparison with roulette. War, as Clausewitz pointed out, is a form of gambling. He said, in the whole range of human activities, war most closely resembles the game of cards. Actually, that takes worse than cards because the stakes are higher and you're far more likely to lose. Okay. But the point is that this is a form of high state gambling. Okay. So whenever anybody tells you that, oh, if we intervene in Syria or someone else, we can achieve Y, bear in mind what they're asking you to do is gamble. Okay. And gamble with high stakes for unknown outcomes in a game which is rigged against you. Now, the last part of the problem is that when states go to war, they really have no clear political objective. The decision is an emotional one. Okay. I'll take the case to say Vietnam. It's very interesting, uh, I think you can get on YouTube, which is a, a documentary of, uh, I don't know if it's YouTube, it's a documentary by a guy called Bill Moyers called LBJ's Road to War. And it's mainly made up of tapes of President Johnson talking to people on the telephone about whether he should intervene in, in Vietnam. And he knows it's a bad idea. He knows it's not going to work. And yet he does it anyway. Why? Because he thinks he'll look foolish if he doesn't. LBJ had some, some manhood issues. Um, <laughs> and, and, and it was all really about not wanting to look unmanly. So even though he knew it was wrong and wouldn't work, he did it anyway because you had to look strong. And this is the sort of reason why politicians actually wage war. There's a, a good book out by a guy called Richard Ned LeBeau called Why Nations Fight, which basically concludes that leaders go to war for prestige, credibility, pride, and other facets of honor. Okay. Why did Afghanistan, for instance, uh, fight in Afghanistan? Why did Canada, for instance, fight in Afghanistan? Well, a guy called Richard Cohen, who was a senior advisor to Canadian Defence Minister Peter McKay, said this, Sometimes it's not possible to win, but being there, you still come out of it with a lot of credit. You enhance your reputation. It's not always about winning and losing. We're playing the game in big ways. 
So that's one of the defence ministers' advisers saying why 124 men lost their lives in the Canadian forces in Afghanistan because it makes us look big. The problem is these motives are actually very bad motives in terms of having a coherent strategy because if the aim is just to be there in order to prove how big you are, there's no objective to which to direct your force because the force itself is kind of the objective. Strategy is about applying force to achieve an end. But if the end is just being there, how do you apply the force? Well, anywhere is as good as anywhere else. So strategy becomes rudderless and pointless. And the result is you don't achieve very much because you have no sense of proper aim and depth. Now, Clausewitz, again, we turn to him a lot because he's important, talks about this incoherence when he points out that military objectives diverge from political objectives in war. Okay? You start with a political objective, say, do this, but to do that, you first got to overcome the enemy, so overcoming the enemy becomes all important, and military objectives take over, and you forget why you were doing it in the first place. Okay? And what Clausewitz points out is that the close, the more important the objective, the less likely this is to happen. Right? If the objective is really important, you will tend to remain focused on it. But if it's less important, the, the military objective will take over. Right? The problem is that the modern effort to roll back barriers to war is based on humanitarian claims. We're doing it to help other people. But this is actually a very weak motive to go to war, because helping other people, however good it may be, isn't something which deeply affects us. We're not, if we're fighting for our own lives, that really matters. And it's really important to keep your eye on the ball. But if it's about helping someone else, well, it doesn't matter quite so much, right? As a result, there's a much greater tendency for the military and the political objective to diverge. And as a result, strategy becomes rudderless. I hope this makes sense to you, but it is, it is fairly logical. Okay. Um, as a result, uh, a British academic, Ken Blue, <laughs> says, just wars encourage bad strategy. So humanitarian interventions are likely to be accompanied by poor strategy and misapplication of force for the simple reason that the objective is not sufficiently powerful enough for us and therefore the military and political objectives will diverge. Okay. So what this means is that you should only go to war when the motivations are very powerful. In other words, when truly vital interests such as your life or your survival are at stake. But we've got into the habit of referring to every little interest as a vital interest. You know, this is a career as a vital interest, Syria is a vital interest. No, it's not. Okay? Canada's not going to cease to exist because of what happens in Syria. Right? It is not a vital interest for us, and therefore we should not fight over it. Not because it's self not because it's kind of selfish only to fight for vital interests, <coughs> but because the only things you can fight properly for are vital interests. So, up to now, what I've been trying to tell you is that war is not a suitable tool for achieving policy objectives. And the other equally compelling reason against it is the effect that war and the armies it produces have on us. Okay. This was well recognized by people a few centuries ago, such as, for instance, the founding fathers of the United States, such as James Madison, who said, the means of defense against foreign danger historically have become the instruments of tyranny at home. We would do well to heed this warning. To fight a war, you have to create armed forces. You then have to keep the armed forces in being once the war is over. So, let's say you want to intervene in Syria. To do that, we've got to have armed forces. Once we stop intervening in Syria, we're going to have to keep these armed forces. So we're going to keep on paying ever more for these armed forces. And then we're going to create forces which we're going to want to use, because they'll be sitting around here when they use these guns. And that will lead us into doing foolish things because we've got these guns. And it will lead to higher taxes, which means we have less money to do other things. It will undermine our economy. It will also have various other effects. For instance, it creates what President Eisenhower called the military industrial complex. Now, the military industrial complex doesn't exist in the form of sort of conspiracy of defense lobbyists sitting in a dark, filled, smoke filled room conspiring to undermine our democracy. Okay? It's, it's much more amorphous than that, but nonetheless, the defence lobby as such does exist, and it exists because we've created these armies, and we continue to perpetuate these armies in the name of humanitarian interventionism. 
And then the power that this military industrial complex holds distorts the priorities of government. You try eliminating a defense project. It's damn difficult. Okay. There are stories in America, like, you know, things which everybody knows are a vast waste of money, but no one can ever quite get around to getting rid of them. In Canada, for instance, recently we have what was called the Jenkins Report, which is just an awful, awful, awful piece of work, um, produced essentially by the defense lobby, although notionally an independent report which said that defence spending was good for the economy, in fact, much better for the economy than other forms of spending, and that, therefore, we ought to identify key sectors of the defence sector in which we should ensure that money is pumped into Canadian companies only. It's a sort of worst sort of military Keynesianism imaginable, adopted very happily by a supposedly free market conservative government. It, it, it's, uh, it's bizarre, but that indicates the sort of power of the defence lobby. When you look at the defense Jenkins report, look at the back, see a list of people consulted. Defence industry, defence industry, defence industry, defence industry. Okay. Anybody outside the defence industry? No. Okay. And here you have a prime example of a defence lobby distorting the priorities of the Canadian government, leading to wasteful expenditure, crazy economic policy. Okay, why? Because in the name of this humanitarian interventionism, we're perpetuating a military industrial complex, which is then come to have lobbying power. So the domestic consequences of war are bad, but they can go on for worse than that. They undermine our democracy in many other ways. For instance, there is no such thing as an honest war. I have lost count of the number of times I have heard Canadian generals telling us that the Taliban were on the run in Afghanistan. And I used to ask my military friends and relatives, you know, are they stupid or are they lying? At which point I get sort of embarrassing. Ah, I don't want to say. Um, the problem is, none of it has ever been true. Okay. So what we have when we engage in this sort of activity is we create deceit in our democratic system. Okay? And this fits a pattern in war of false claims used to justify military action, demonize enemies, cover up failures. From stories of Germans bayoneting German babies and Belgian babies in 1914 to Iraqi weapons and mass destructions, the military and political leaders of democratic states have proven themselves to be masters of deceit. Unfortunately, the targets of their deceit are not the enemy, they are us, their fellow citizens. Okay. War tramples on constitutional freedoms. This is not a new phenomenon. For instance, in the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, that great liberator, unconstitutionally suspended habeas corpus and then arrested judges who objected to it. Okay. In the First World War, the Sedition Act of the United States tore up the First Amendment guaranteeing free speech to shreds by forbidding disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the US government or its armed forces, and then used these to imprison opposition leaders such as socialist leader Eugene Debs. In the so-called War on Terror, the Bush and Obama administrations have laid claims to expansive interpretations of state secrets privileges to dismiss lawsuits against those kidnapped and tortured at their behest. Again and again, war has been used to silence opposition, extend state power, and diminish citizens' rights. Do not imagine that are we ever any different in the future. So while I talk about direct costs of war, I'd like to finish with a little bit about opportunity costs. The costs of doing something are only part of the cost. Another part of the cost is what you're not able to do because you're doing that. I advise you to, to listen to Eisenhower's uh, famous final speech as president in which he denounced the military industrial complex, in which he points out how much the cost of every single bomber produced was in terms of schools not built, hospitals not built, people not treated for disease, and so on. Take, for instance, the current passion for humanitarian intervention. <coughs> This is justified by the idea that we are making the world a better place. <coughs> but if it's so, the value for money has been minuscule. Let's say that the mission in Afghanistan, which has cost NATO a trillion dollars, has made Afghanistan marginally <coughs> better off. Has it made it a trillion dollars worth better off? If we spent that trillion dollars on something else, would we have achieved more or less? Well, the answer is more. Okay. We do not get a trillion dollars worth of better value because of it. 
One study which examined the cost-benefit ratio of international policies concluded that if you want to improve the world, the most cost-effective policies you can undertake include providing micronutrients to children, liberalizing trade, immunizing children, lowering the price of schooling. If the money we spent in Afghanistan, we had liberalized our trade with the free world, which would cost Canadian producers some money, okay? But it wouldn't cost nearly as much as we spent in Afghanistan. We would do those third world countries that have a lot more good. For a fraction of the cost for what we spent in Afghanistan. Let's take a recent report published by the World Health Organization. This is what it says. Malaria control measures saved an estimated 1.2 million lives in Africa between 2000 and 2011, and if they continue, can save a further 3 million lives by 2015. So that's a million lives saved in 10 years through anti-malaria measures. How much did that cost? $1.5 billion to save a million lives. How much is $1.5 billion? That's how much the United States spends in Afghanistan in one week. So, is that $1.5 billion spent in Afghanistan a good expenditure compared to $1.5 billion spent on saving a million lives against malaria? The answer, obviously, is no. So if you look at the opportunity costs of this humanitarian <coughs> intervention, you find that it's extremely costful because there are much better ways of using your resources to make the world a better place. I'll end up with one final one. War is habit forming. Okay? The Greek word ethos, which comes to mean ethics, literally means habit. Okay? Effort to your habits. Okay? Now, many humanitarian interventionists point to Kosovo and say, look, in Kosovo we liberated the Kosovo. And you got what was called a sort of marriage of the human rights of the left and the new imperialist right. And many of these new human rightists took from Kosovo the lesson that military force could be used to transform the world for the better. And many of them, like Michael Ignatia, therefore became prominent supporters of the Iraq War. Okay. And Ignatia is a really good case of the sheer pink-headed, wrong-headedness of the liberal interventions. Okay? Because Ignatia decides that Kosovo is a good thing, so therefore Iraq must be a good thing. Okay? Because military intervening helps people. And so you see how Habit, bad habits form. Even if we say, and I actually disagree, but if even you agree that Kosovo helped people, the result of Kosovo is Iraq. The one leads into the other. Okay. So a consequence, when you're considering the consequences of Kosovo, they're not just what happened in Kosovo, they're what happened in Iraq as well. Okay. Which are extremely negative. Four million refugees, several hundred thousand people dead, billions of dollars damaged. So, if you look further down the line, this is a bad habit. Okay. And the way to avoid bad habits is not even to do them, even when they seem to be a good thing. Now, this is kind of hard, it's what the philosophers would call a rule consequentialist argument, which basically means you shouldn't do something even if it's a good idea, because in general it's a bad idea. Okay. So, even if you could say this intervention will definitely work, you still shouldn't do it because interventions per se are not a good idea. And if you do it once, you'll do it again, and you'll do it again, and so on. Okay, so when we're considering the rules of the international system, we must consider which rules create the best consequences, and the rules which prohibit these sort of interventions are the ones which are best. Therefore, we should not do it. So war, to conclude, is not a precise tool you can use to achieve, in an easy way, exact political objectives. Okay. It is an action the devil by chance, uncertainty and chaos. It's a form of gambling which is by nature, nature unsuited to humanitarian goals. Its opportunity costs are high, it distorts priorities, it undermines democratic government. It is to be avoided unless truly vital interests are at stake, which in essence means unless it's a matter of your survival. Okay. The, war, the rules which govern war should reflect this. That means that we should not abide or try and promote rules which you encourage humanitarian intervention. So, to wrap up, what does this mean for Syria? Well, since my argument is that interventions are generically wrong, intervention in Syria is wrong. And it's wrong even if it's good. Okay? Because it's contrary to the rule that it's wrong. Okay? 
Because even if it's good, it will get you in a bad habit. Also, it would, it would perpetuate military industrial complex and blah, 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 and all, this, all the results which come from that. Okay? But it's unlikely to be good anyway. Okay? Given past performance, it is unlikely that any military action will in fact have precisely defined and achievable objectives. More likely it will be done out of some emotional sense that we must do something and we'll look weak if we don't do anything. And our credibility is on the line, right? And all this kind of flip flap. And, and as a result, it will be very unfocused use of force, which will not um, <coughs> enable us to have coherent strategy, and it will be this divergence of military and political objectives, and it will all go horribly wrong. Okay? But even if the results are good, as measured in terms of Syria, okay, that will be longer term consequences to be harmful. Let's make a comparison with the economy. Economic planning fails for many reasons. One of the most important of which is that it rests on a sort of rationalist arrogance that we are capable of understanding and controlling the vast amount of information which makes up an economic system. Liberal interventionism similarly rests on a sort of arrogance that we really understand what's going on in Syria somewhere, and that we understand what will happen if we use force, and we can carefully apply it in exactly the right amount, in exactly the right place, to produce a sort of positive outcome. But war is not like that. Okay? This is the realm of uncertainty and chaos and, and, and gambling. Okay? And it is arrogance to think that you can understand and control a phenomenon such as war, which in fact will end up controlling you. Now, I don't want to sort of say rationalism is a bad idea, but at the same time, we must understand that there are limits to our ability to understand. Okay. And to kill people on the arrogance that we do understand is, I believe, a very grave ethical and political error. As a result, we should be well advised to stand back. Now, fortunately, at the moment, it looks as if the United States will not be taking military action against Syria. I mean, Three weeks ago, I'd have said they were going to take another reaction. Okay? Today, I'm pretty certain they're not going to. I think that the, the, the momentum in that direction is pretty much dead. Okay? Um, so perhaps, at long last, politicians are learning the lesson that war is not a useful tool for achieving policy objectives. I certainly hope that is the case. Okay? So thank you for your attention and for this point which bombard me with any questions you may have. Um.